All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can be here tonight. God, thank you again for your gracious provision. And Lord, thank you that every time we shift meeting places, God, we have we have not had to pay for that as we did in the old days. And God, we thank you for that. Um, Lord, we pray that you would help us, Lord, in a real living spiritual way. Lord, we pray that you would um, strike something deep. Lord, whether it be to encourage or to confirm something or to arrest someone's attention or to explain a dilemma. Lord, in Jesus' name, please help us, Lord. We pray there be no confusion. God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Titus chapter 1, and you know, we were in verse 9, and uh, so we're going we're gonna to pick up there. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars. Evil beasts, slow bellies, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and into every good work reprobate. The word unruly shows up a couple times here. And uh, look at it in verse 10. It says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. There are many. Um, the word unruly is an interesting word when you look it up in the old dictionary. It means, uh, in the English, it means ignoring restraint. It means naturally inclined to violate laws. That's the people that their philosophy is rules are made to be broken. I hate to disappoint you. Maybe you've heard that all your life. It might have been your grandma who told you that. But I just want you to know that is hogwash. They were not made to be broken. Naturally inclined to violate laws. Impossible to govern, and I love this last one, unruly. Accustomed to break over fences and escape from enclosures. Breaking over the fence. He said there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. So really where most of our comments are going to go tonight is really centered around verse 16. And it really seems like the whole passage is leading into verse 16. Verse 16 says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. You've got these people that say they're believers, they say they know the Lord, and uh, but boy, their life just says something altogether different. And... Um, and it starts off here in verse 10. There are many unruly and vain talkers. Talkers. Um, I'm sure most of you guys are ladies are very, very aware of this. I'm sure you've, you know, seen lots of it in your, in your days as believers, unless you just got saved real recently. You know, there's a lot of people that, you know, they sure can talk the Christian life. They sure can talk the terminology. They can, they, they've mastered this thing of fitting in. And depending on who they're with, and they know what the boundaries are, and they know what's acceptable with whoever they're with, you know, and, and uh, they're, they're chameleons, you know, they can change color with whoever they're around, and um, they can talk it, but it's vain talk. They can talk it, but they can't live it. Verse 16, they profess that they know God. Um, you know, he's, he's going down through this... this um, this, these verses, let's just walk down through here real quick. Verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped. And, 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 and boy, that, that's just an amazing statement. Paul is writing to Titus and said, we've got to shut them up. But you know, how do you do that? Because violence wasn't an option. You know, they didn't have lynch mobs at the first church of Crete. Um, you know, we, we would, 
There are some of us that would really welcome the chance to join one of those, but it's just not God's way. And uh, so how are they going to be stopped? How are these people that are doing this collateral damage going to be stopped? Well, there's a couple ways, two or three ways. One is by prayer. One is by you living such a way that um, you look to, you make the truth look so good and you make them look so bad that it shuts their mouths. Whose mouths must be stopped. And boy, there's nothing that'll stop the mouth of one of these um, ignorant pretenders that do so much damage to Christianity and do so much damage in the workplace and do so much damage among our youth. There's nothing that'll shut them up like somebody that really lives it. Their mouth must be stopped. It says they teach things, verse 11, which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. You know, they, they teach things that, that um, really are wrong. And, and really what's implied in this passage is they even, even their heart of hearts, they know it's wrong. But boy, somehow in the background, money has entered the picture. Maybe, you know, uh, maybe somebody's given them money to stay with their group. And can I encourage our young people, boy, that day will come even in the independent Baptist ranks, money talks. And it is a wonderful day when you will reach that point where to your great pain, but to God's glory, you cannot be bought. Boy, there's people, you know, you, you know, we just had Brother Colburn here. And uh, boy, I traveled the road, uh, you know, for a few years as a missionary in deputation. I know how that works. And I have very little of that support now, just a little handful now that's, that's left from all that. And the church supports us, and so God's good, and it's all worked out. But boy, I remember some scary days when, when two different preachers decided to cut me off, and they had influence, and they had my mail-out list, and they cut me off. And they warned me first. <laughs> Shut up. Do what we say, or you lose your money. They do it not for the Lord. Well, you'd be amazed. Some people that are that do things and say things, and uh, even choose the wrong crowd, and uh, and they're hooped into the wrong crowd, and they're pressured, and they they're really they're really sanctioning some things they really shouldn't. But you know what they're afraid of? They're afraid it's going to hurt their paycheck. And I'm not just talking about preachers. I'm talking about Oh, it's going to hurt their business connections. It is a wonderful day when you have enough courage for the Lord's sake. And I'm not talking about being a fool. You know, you'll, you'll do everything you can to not cause yourself grief. That's just wisdom. But boy, there comes a place when you just got to realize, okay, you know what? I'm either going to do what's right and, and suffer some loss and, oh, heaven forbid, and I'll have to trust the Lord. Or I'll stay where I'm at even though it's wrong, so I can keep the money flowing. Verse 12. You're going to cross that bridge, young people. You are going to cross that bridge. Oh, there's some tests coming. And it's funny, some of those tests don't just come once. They'll come back around in life. But happy is the man or the woman that will serve God. Paul said, I know how to, you know, I'm not a gloom and doom guy. I'm not saying, oh, you'll suffer for Jesus. And bless God, if you can have two eggs a week, be thankful. <laughs> no. You know what Paul said? Paul didn't say, I always am abased. No, that's not what he said. He said, I know how to be abased and how to abound. Paul said there were some good times. Paul said, there were some times God blessed me richly. He said, I've been on both ends of that. But Paul was going to serve God no matter which end of the stick he was on. Verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, Beasts 
A beast is pushy, overbearing, itself only. I want what I want. Boy, I'm going to get what I want. You know, and, and every, every, every young lady, that is always one of the challenges you face when, you know, you're, you're looking to find some guy. And boy, he's just so sweet, wonderful, handsome. And, and you know what? You just, you just need to pray. Because every once in a while, they get sucker punched. And then they realize they're married to a beast. He said they're always liars. Evil beasts. Slow bellies. Slow bellies, you look it up, it just it's, the thought is that they were very lazy. And the Holy Ghost says in verse 13, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men. Jewish fables, you know, that would be um, extra biblical writings, you know. You know, uh, boy, some things have gotten popular um, in our day. Uh, you know, I always heard about it, but, you know, um, it, in the last two or three years, um, I've read it, I've heard it, I've, I've followed guys on Instagram, um, not on Instagram, I followed a few uh, uh, news guys, and uh, they bring up the Book of Enoch, the Book of Enoch, the Book of Enoch, and there's other books like that. And, um, you know, you know, um, the only thing that you know is true, every word, is the book in your hand. That is, anything else, you know, it's just the writing of men. That's why we don't have the Apocrypha in our Bible. That's those 13 or 14 books, however many books it is, that, um, uh, you know, people have debated over. Are they, but the problem with the Apocrypha is there, there, um, there, there are things in there that contradict each other. There's things in there that his, they're historic, historically inaccurate and all that stuff. But the bottom line is, Jesus never quoted from the Apocrypha, ever. It's interesting. Uh, the Holy Ghost allowed Paul to quote a heathen poet on one or two occasions, but never the Apocrypha. And yet, yet the New Testament is filled with a multitude of Old Testament references. Those guys were quote, quoting the Old Testament all the time. Not giving heed to Jewish fables. And the next phrase, verse 14, and commandments of men. You know, I, I call that the unwritten rule book. The unwritten rule book. You know, some of you will remember months and months and months ago, we spent two or three Wednesday nights and we talked about um, the unwritten uh, Baptist rule book and how churches and pastors are very intimidated by that. Of course, nobody's ever seen it, but they must have it because, you know, everybody runs by it. And uh, we talked about that. You know that. You know what God wants you to do. He wants you to do what He said: the commandments of men. He said, "Don't don't give heed to Jewish fables. Don't give heed to the commandments of men." Um, verse fifteen: Under the pure, all things are pure. But under them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Verse sixteen is the great revealer, the great revealer. They profess that they know God. You know, uh, you, you meet somebody and, uh, you know, you get talking and, and um, uh, are, are you a Christian? My, my neighbor came over the other day and I, I have a brand new neighbor on one side. And, um, uh, you know, as many of you have seen, my, my wife has a couple of these big banners that real pretty things hang. And uh, there's a big one. And I think the big one says, you know, with God, all things are possible. And, and then she's got a little one that says trust in the Lord or something. And my neighbor is talking yesterday and uh, he's he's about 35. And he was talking, he said, and something he said was a blessing. And so I I I, I caught it and uh, my wife was standing there. She brought that up to me today. And, um, uh, you know, does does he know the Lord? Well, I haven't had a chance to sit down and talk. It was pretty quick. Um, but boy, there's a lot of people that, you know, they'll tell you they're a Christian. They'll tell you that they know the Lord. He said about these people in Crete, he said they profess that they know God. He said they'll tell you that they know the Lord. 
but in works they deny Him. He said, if you watch what they do, he said, they, they just totally cancel out their Christian profession. Um, look at, with me, if you would, at a couple places. Look at Matthew chapter 7, first of all. This is the great revealer. The great revealer. It is the absolute test of somebody's Christianity. They profess that they know God. Paul said in one place to a group he was writing to, he says, you, thou hast professed a good profession in front of many witnesses. And, and, you know, we have a profession. We, you know, we do profess that we know God. But you know as well as I do, what makes it count or not count is, um, is how they live. You know, it's, it's what are they doing. Look at Matthew 7, verse 15. Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do you, hey, hey, listen, guys, listen. People get mad at some of us because, you know, we're just really skeptical. And uh, I think Paul was very skeptical. I think Paul was very black and white. I think John was very black and white. And you read their writings, and it's really black and white. Um, you know, oh preacher, you know that but they but they say they're a Christian, okay? You know, I, th that's not real impressive. You know, anybody can say anything, and if they live a life that doesn't match that profession, we have every right to question. You say, well, well, you know, they were saved when they were eight years old in in uh, in Sunday school, okay? Uh, so they say, so they say, but are they vain talkers? How do you know? What did their works look like? What's their life look like? What's their viewing look like? What's their leisure time look like? What's their joking look like? That tells the story. What you say with your mouth doesn't tell the story. It just tells us what you want us to hear. And everybody around you Birds of a feather flock together. See, all, all, all the people that got that same kind of profession, oh yeah, you know, we're all Christians, but the people that really know the Lord, you know, usually they're pretty quiet. You know, they just sort of stand back and they're going, I don't know about this. I wouldn't want to face God with what you got. Verse 16. You shall know them by the fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit, this is its destination. It is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall, K-N-O-W, ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Jesus said, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He said, there's a lot of vain talkers. He said, not everybody that says, yeah, I got saved in a Baptist church when I was 12 years old. No, 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 they're not all saved. Not on your life. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Is he teaching salvation by works there? No. He's talking about their fruits. He's talking about their fruits. Verse 22. Many will say, vain talkers. Many will say to me in that day, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, 
and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at His doctrine. For He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Look at 1 John chapter 2. There right before Revelation there, you'll see 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Jude. Go to 1st John. First John 2. First John 2. The Great Revealer. First John 2, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments is a liar. That's pretty black and white. Like he didn't say, you know, he, he's, he didn't say, well, you know, you can't really say, but maybe possibly, you know, you don't know about their upbringing and you know, you don't know about, you know, the Lord is funny. He doesn't make all those psychological allowances. He just says, how are they living? And God says, if they don't, honor me. He said, they don't know me. Verse 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in Him. You know, um, in Titus there, uh, keep your place there if you if you would in Titus 1. Titus, um, Paul is writing to Titus, and Paul is not talking about sinless perfection. Okay? Um, you know, the Lord said in many places, but in Ecclesiastes 7 it says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Look at Proverbs 24 with me. Proverbs 24, verse 16. For a just man, that's a guy that loves the Lord. That's a guy that really, you know, he, he really believes what God said. And he's or a, or a lady. They're really trying to follow the Lord. A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. You know, a, a just man, you know, a, there's nobody that lives, lives without sin. It'd be nice if, if we could. Um, you know, it, it's, it's be good if, if the longer that we live, you know, sin becomes the exception, not the rule. You remember the lady taken in adultery? God looked at her, and man, He delivered her from her accusers. And um, He said, Lady, where are thine accusers? And she said, Lord, they're gone. And, and he said, neither do I condemn thee. And then he said, go and sin no more. Uh, he said in 1 John, these things have I written unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And a just man loves those verses because, you know, um, we delight in the law of God after the inward man. But there is another law in our members that wars against us to bring us into captivity to that law of sin. And, you know, there'll be a day when we'll be perfect, and that'll be the day we breathe our last breath. That'll be the day the trumpet sounds. and We'll go up, and we'll never have a bad thought. We'll never have another bad reaction. We'll never, you know, you know, wrestle with an ungodly imagination. We'll never wrestle with our attitude. Um, we'll never wrestle with our sharp tongue. We'll never wrestle with our weakness. It'll be gone. I can't imagine what it's going to feel like. I'm looking forward to that day. But um, 
A just man does fall. But God says the mark of a just man is he gets up. But he said, but the wicked, he said, they just fall. A wicked man falls. He doesn't get up. He stays. He goes back for more. Second Peter 3, it said, it's like the dog that is returned to his vomit. And like a sow that is washed to her wallowing in the mire. You know what they do? What they do by nature? They just go back for more. I mean, uh, there's no desire to change. They always default to what they are. They cannot maintain what is not in their heart. There is no love of truth. There may be a love of appearing to love the truth. You know, if you want to fit in our churches, you know, you know, um, uh, you know, you got to at least make it look good. You know, you, you got to make it look like you're interested. But there's a big difference between making it look like you're, you're part of the gang and actually loving the truth. Look at Second Thessalonians for a moment. Second Thessalonians. And I'm not I'm not accusing any of you in this room of this tonight. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm probably preaching to the choir here. But but, you know, um, Titus is demonstrating something. And it is the curse of our churches. It is the curse of Christianity. Is all these people that, you know, they, they, um, they profess that they know God. But everybody that lives with them, everybody that lives around them, everybody that hangs out with them, everybody that knows them intimately, you know, they would say it like this. They would say, well, you know what, they're just, they're just not real serious. I know a person can be carnal. We, you know, First Corinthians, they can be carnal. But it was to the carnal church that Paul wrote, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Because he said, I can't tell by your works whether you're saved or lost. He said, you're living like a lost man. And God said, when you live that way, most of the time you wind up in the lake of fire. You know, an old man of God said years ago, you don't live your life bent toward hell and wind up in heaven. Somebody else said it like this, no holy life, no Holy Ghost. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let. To let means to hinder. Paul said, I would have come once and again, but I, but I was let hitherto. Um, that means hindered. You know, there's something in this world that is hindering ungodliness from, from where it's going to be someday. Okay? And the mystery of iniquity, verse 7, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of His mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of His coming. Even Him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And then that perish. He's going to come and uh, He's going to have all these lying wonders and He's going to deceive people, verse 10, because they received not the love of the truth. It didn't say they didn't receive the truth. They didn't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, there's there's people, and Paul is writing to these, these uh, uh, to Titus. He said, Titus, I'm going to leave you in Crete. And he said, these people, people just by their culture, he said, evil is ingrained. Um, terrible evil is ingrained in their culture. And, um, and he said, uh, he said I, I put you there, Titus, to set in order the things that are wanting. He said, even among the believers, they've, uh, they're still, some of them are still floating in and out of that old life. They're still, uh, they're, they're still wanting to embrace that. And, um, and he said, I put you there to address this. He said, they profess that they know God. There's some people, they have no love of truth, but they want to seem like they love the truth. 
And there's something too that brings in some people, there's this, there's this love of control and somehow it enables them to control, you know, they've got some element in their, in their little sphere of influence and they've got some image and their Christianity is a learned behavior. It is not a heart behavior. You know what? They grew up since they were this high. And thank God, you know, they, they grew up memorizing Scripture. They grew up hearing preaching. And, um, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But, you know, there, there comes a place where real salvation must take place. There comes a place where it's got to go deep enough that that young person, you know, or wherever it is along the way, where they... They, they make a very hard and fast black and white decision where they turn to God for themselves and they say, yep, yeah, all I heard growing up, I believe it. I believe the story of Jesus Christ. I'm going that way. I'm going that way with all my heart. Though no one join me, still I will follow. And I love Jesus and I love His book and I'm in. See, until that happens, it's just a learned behavior. You know, Tony Hudson is, an, is a pastor and evangelist, and some years ago he was preaching, and he was at a big Christian educators conference, and they had a lot of young college age and high school age um, Christian young people there. It was a big bunch, several hundred people sitting there. And you have to know Tony Hudson. He's he is a fire breathing preacher in his own right, and uh, he gets up and he's preaching. And um, he said, "Before I got in the building," he said, "Before I got in the building," he said, "I'm walking across the parking lot," and he said, "This mom and her and her and her uh, her her young teenage boy uh, came across the parking lot, and they knew who I was." And he said, "I didn't know them, but they recognized me." And, and he said, they came up and said, Brother Hudson, can, and the little boy, uh, little boy, I mean, he was a young teenager. He said, can you sign my Bible? And Tony Hudson said, something just sparked in my heart. And he said, I, I looked at him and he said, I wasn't trying to be rude. He said, son, he said, when did you get saved? And he said, he looked at his mom. And he said, now, mom, when was it I got saved? Do you not know? Surely you've got more than a learned behavior. Surely. Surely you've had a hard experience with the, the creator of the universe. Surely you have. Or you, or you don't know him. It may not have been a dramatic, you know, you might not have, you know, had some, but you know what? You, you remember. You remember. You remember the season. You might not remember the day on the calendar, but you remember, yeah, I was just, you know, I was, you know, in, I was in my bedroom, you know, it was back in the summer, you know, of whatever year it was. And, and I realized I was lost and I wanted, I wanted Jesus Christ. Tony Hudson said, I got in that auditorium to preach that night. And he said, there were hundreds of young people there. And he said, there was a few preachers scattered throughout the crowd. He said, and there was, of course, a, a, the pastor on the platform. I was on the platform, a song leader on the platform. And he said, uh, he said I got preaching away. And, and, um, and he said, I just, I just said this in passing. I was just going somewhere with my message. And I said, I said, all right, you guys, you remember when God was dealing with your heart? And he said, without thinking, I said, you do remember. How many of you remember those days when God was dealing with your heart? He said, three hands went up. He said, I thought. He said, you know how preachers say things wrong sometimes? You know, like they get Jonah in the ark. You know, and he said, I, he thought, surely, oh, I, I must have said it wrong. So he said, I backed up and I said it again. He said, surely you guys remember. He said, how many of you remember those days when God was dealing with your heart? And you were convicted and, and you knew you needed the Lord. He said, three hands went up. And he said, then I knew I was in trouble. He said, because the whole crowd said they were saved. But only three remembered. I'm telling you what, man, I remember. 
I remember when my dad got saved. I was six years old. We started going to church. And I remember the preacher through those years. I remember him preaching and talking about heaven and hell and the end times. I was six years old. And I remember, I didn't understand it all, but God was dealing with my heart. And I knew I needed to be saved. I remember more than once I went up. You know, I remember one day I was eight years old this time, April 2nd, 1972, Easter Sunday, and I was holding on to the pew. Dad knew I was under conviction. So I was always afraid to go up front because in those days, you know, I was really bashful and really timid. And uh, I really was. And, and you know what? I looked at my dad. The service was over. The service was over. Crowd about, the, about this size. And I said, Dad, can I talk to the preacher? I'm sure my dad's heart was singing for joy. He said, sure, son. Man, I went up and talked to the preacher. You know what? Somehow I didn't get saved that night. I missed it. But my point is, there were several times between then and when I got saved when I was 18 where the fear of God was ringing in my heart. And I knew if I missed salvation, I missed heaven. Tony Hudson said, I looked at that preacher. And I said, okay, what do I do now? Because he said, I need to preach. He said, he said, I knew what I needed to do. I need to preach this whole crowd as if they were lost. And what I wanted to know was, was the preacher going to be okay with that? And all these parents sitting out there? See, we got this thing where Christianity becomes a learned behavior. And here's what happens. They get 18, 19, 20, 22, 24. Finally, they start to experiment a little bit, you know, and, and, and they start experimenting, you know. And, of course, nowadays, you know, the social drink and things coming in the church and all this stuff. Next thing you know, they're, they're – they're, and hear me out now. Don't be offended. I'm just making a statement. And the next thing you know, they got a few tattoos, and then they're, then they're drinking with their buddies and – and then and I'm thinking of somebody right now that I know that grew up in an independent Baptist church. I know this story several times over. And, uh, and you know where they're at today? They don't even believe in God. You say, how does that happen? Their Christianity was a learned behavior. There had been no conversion. But for all those years, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah. So when did you get saved? Oh, you know, I was, I was eight years old. And, and I, children can get saved. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come under. But they can, hey, that's the best time to get saved, for sure. And they profess that they know God. You know, the biggest curse on anybody's... These people in Crete, a lot of them were saved. Paul said, I'm leaving you there, Titus, because there are some safe folks there. He says, you're going you're gonna to start some churches. You're going to do that. But he said, there's some people there. And he says, they're going to tell you that they're saved. But he said, the way they live, nobody's ever going to know they're a Christian. Nobody's ever even going to suspect. You know what kills Christianity? We, we have, we've had conversations. Um, you know, some of you, you know, no, nobody... Some of you have been through some bad church situations, and you know you you know some pastors, you know some clergymen, and you know what? They were evil. They were evil. Boy, they could talk about God, couldn't they? Vain talkers. You know what'll gain people's respect for your Christianity? is in your works, you living wholeheartedly, sincerely for God. And when you do that, and you say, I'm a Christian, I know the Lord, they'll say, there's a real Christian right there. A man that knows God, a woman that knows God, they grieve when they sin. Their heart condemns them. They want to overcome it. They sure look forward to that day when they're going to be free of their sin. But the one that, the one that doesn't um, grieve, the one that's lost, 
the one that's the one that's got that profession thing going on, um, they grieve that they must be restrained. Is your sin a grief, or does it bug you when somebody tries to rein you in? Does it bug you? They get frustrated when they get challenged about their sin, and they will challenge you over your definition of sin. Look at verse 16 again. Titus 1, verse 16. Almost done. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable. You know what abominable means? It's interesting. Um, it means to hate it extremely. You know, man, you ought to look, you ought to run the references on abominations to God. Go with me real quick to Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6, verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. Did you ever think about that? You know what a proud look is? We see it lots. You've seen it lots. You, you might have done it. You probably did. You know, it's, a, it's, it's the cool dude look. You know, you like my shades? Like my tennis shoes? See the little brand name? You know? Proud look. You know what God says? Isn't that wild? Do you ever think about these things? God says He resists the proud. I'm not saying you have to go around with your head down. None of us do that. You know, you could just be normal. You could just be relaxed. You could just, you could just be a, a nice, gracious, kind person. You don't have to walk around like, oh, you know, I, I, I tell you what, uh, great, big, well-known, if I mention his name, you guys would know it. Don't ask me after. I'm not going to tell you. But, but uh, a well-known Christian leader who got caught in immorality. And, um, boy, that story has been told over and over and over with various clergymen and um but he got caught pastored a huge church and his kids were adults and uh you guys know i go down to brother bishops a couple times a year well brother bishop's brother's name is phil he's a great guy loves the lord and um phil told me he said yeah he said i was at that church and he said i went up and talked to the the preacher's son and he said he treated me like i was dirt you know what that is? Oh, who are you? Oh, yeah. I don't think we know you. You know what God does? God wants to kill over that. Do you ever notice how often God killed people in the Bible? Abomination means He hates it. And God hates it with an extreme hate. The word abomination means extreme. It means excessive. It like it pushes God off the cliff. Proverbs 6. Let's look at it. The proud look, the lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, verse 18, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift and running to mischief. Well, he mentions it again. He mentions this twice. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among brethren. They profess that they know God. But in works they deny Him being abominable. Abominable. And disobedient. And into every good work reprobate. I want you to look at uh, verse 13, and we're done tonight. Verse 13. Verse 13. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in faith. And boy, what a what a what a piece of advice to this young pastor, Titus. He said, he said, the people you're going to deal with. He said, if you let them, they're going to they're gonna lie to you left and right. He said, they're going to be crooked. He said, expect it. 
He said they're pushy, they're manipulators, they're demanding. That's a beast. Uh, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna have their way. They're gonna try to push you around. They're liars. They're slow bellies. They're lazy. They're going to expect you to do everything. They're going to dodge work at every opportunity. Every job they do is going to be half done. So what do you do? So what do you do? He says, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith. He, he doesn't tell them, you know, sort of go in there and sort of, sort of joke them, joke around with them and, and you'll sort of joke them into obedience. I love to laugh, and I do. And I know tonight's pretty hot and heavy. You know, I, I love to laugh. But, um, but you know, um, you know, you got some of this stuff going on. You know, you got this going on in people's hearts. You know, somebody, hey, may, having a learned Christianity instead of a heart Christianity, we're not going to joke about that. That's going to land you in hell. You hurting the name of Christ because of what you joke around with and who you are in private and where you go on the internet, that's no laughing matter. Oh, that's, you know what? We'll just, we'll just, we'll just sort of joke him. We'll sort of help him out. We're just, no. You're not going to help him. You know, Titus, just sort of hint at it. You don't want to hurt their feelings. You don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. So, you know, Titus, learn that, learn the theological hit the theological thing of preacher hinting. No, you don't hint at it. You ready? Titus, you'll need to counsel them. Now, you know what? I, I know counseling has a place. And, you know, we, we misuse that word. Sometimes it's overused. You know, people, people try to get counsel. It's a Bible word. Jesus is called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. But you know what? You know what? There, there's a lot of times that you, you're, you're dealing with somebody. And you know what? You are wasting your time. I sat down with a guy here in the city, and boy, his, uh, he was a guy, he, he, he liked to witness to people. You ready? Ha ha. And he did. Boy, it's just the weirdest thing, how you can be so two-faced and so crooked. And some of it becomes, becomes a smoke screen, because if you look spiritual, you can hide who you really are. And boy, his ugliness started coming out. Not towards me, it was coming out to some, it was just terrible. And it was it was bad, and um, you know what? I tried to be nice, and I tried to be nice, and I tried to be nice. And you guys know me, really. I'm low key. I'm easy going. When I'm in a pulpit, I'm loud, but I'm low key. I don't like to be, you know. But you know what? I had to, I I I finally told him. It was just like, man, I had it up to here, but it wasn't about me. And I knew it was, it was about the people he was hurting that were lost. That I knew that were pointing at him and saying, do you know what this guy is? And I said, hey, I called his name. I said, you've got a choice to make. I said, you're wrong. I said, and we went, we went, we, this a lengthy conversation. I said, you can get right or you can get out. I said, don't you walk back in this church until you have fixed this problem. You say, what were you going to do? Oh, we were going to meet him at the door. I don't know. Some of you don't know that. We've had a few occasions like that. And I've talked to two or three of our guys and I say, if so-and-so shows up at the door, they're not welcome here. You're not going to counsel them into it. You're not going to study guide them into correcting their lying, beastly behavior. Nope, sorry. That's not going to get the job done. You know, the Holy Ghost is always right. And the Holy Ghost said, verse 13, Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. 
You know, there's people that need help. And there's people that need love. And there's people that, that struggle. And you know what? God understands that. It said about our Lord that a bruised reed He wouldn't break. He was gentle. Uh, Take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. But boy, I'm telling you, there was, there was a group of people that there was a different side that came out of Him. And it was the people that were parading under a profession, and they were evil. You say, preacher, if you, if you rebuke them sharply, they'll get offended. Maybe. But they won't live right unless you do. You know, I have prayed, I have prayed, oh dear God, help us. I've prayed, you know, all you guys that got young people growing up, you know, you're praying and you know, none of us are immune from tragedy and disaster. And I'm not talking about a car wreck. I'm talking about moral tragedies and, and just, uh, I got a friend that pastor several hours from here. I'm done. I got a friend that pastor several hours from here. And he said he knew something was up with one of his guys at the church. And he said, one night, he said, I wound up in traffic. And he said, I was a few cars behind him. And he said, I wonder where this dude is going. And he said, I followed him. And he landed at a house of ill repute. He said, ah. He said, I watched him. Sure enough, he went in, did what they do there. He said, a few days later, he said, I, I took him for a walk and I acted like I was trying to get some advice from him. And, and um, he said, he just, he just acted so spiritual. And he said, and then I confronted him. And then I confronted him. The Bible says open rebuke is better than secret love. He says, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. I don't know if you know it or not, but this is the Christianity of our Lord. He wrote this book. And all else is imaginary. Lord knows who you are tonight. Lord knows who I am. And, um, you know, every man at his best state is altogether vanity, and we're all a work in progress. Um, but I trust tonight if you're a professor, but your works deny him. I, I'm not saying that you're not saved. I'm saying you're living like a lost man. And if that be the case, if you find yourself in that place, uh, you know, you, you, today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart. And you know what the Lord wants you to do? He wants you to decide to live for Him. Because then your profession and your works will be one. You can be an influence. You can win people to the Lord. You can speak. You can pray. And it'll count. It'll count for the Lord. Your works, what you do, the way you live, the way you react, the world is looking for Christ. And he's, he's not walking visibly. You know where He's walking? He's walking in you and me. Christ in you. The hope of glory. And if they see Christ in you, you know what they're going to do? They're going to believe what you say. And they're going to be drawn. Oh, they might not embrace it immediately and they might make fun of you and they might not like you and all the rest. But you know what? One day you'll land on the other side and the Lord Jesus will say, you know what? You made me look good. You professed my name and your works matched what you professed. You honored me and He'll have a reward for you. Let's pray.
Lord, help us, I pray. Lord, the acid test of our Christianity, Lord, you said, was not what we say as much as it is what we do. Lord, in Jesus' name, that whether it be in our house, on the job, Lord, in town or wherever we are, Lord, that we would shine for Thee. God, that we'd be a, we'd be a good representative of You. Lord, we'd let You live through us. That our Christianity would be about pleasing You and not, Lord, about a learned behavior. God, help us, we pray. In Jesus' name. The piano is going to play. If God has spoke to you, why don't you talk to Him? There are some people, they're not, they're not ever going to get to heaven. They're not ever going to hear about Jesus unless it's from you and me. But boy, they need to see something. Lord, we thank you for your book. Lord, we pray that you'd help us, Lord, that we in this room, every one of us, Lord, tonight, that we would be burning and shining lights for you. Lord, that we would shine in this dark generation. Lord, that we would love you. We wouldn't care what anybody says, that we couldn't be bought. But Lord, we'd shine for you. We shine for you when it's good and we shine for you when we're stressed and we shine for you when we're healthy and we shine for you when we're sick. And Lord, we would be, Lord, your people. We would bless your name in this dark world. God, help us that when people hear from us and they find out we are Christians, that God, they will like what they see. And Lord, they will know that what you have done for us is real, and it's something worth having, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.